Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Master Series, your guide to intelligent production, brought to you by Entertainment Partners. I'm your host, Natalie Nelson. In the Master Series, we focus on important issues impacting the entertainment industry and its workers through in-depth discussions with legal, tax, payroll, technology, and production experts. Today, we are pleased to present the first episode in our series about film financing, and our expert panel today will be discussing equity financing. Two quick housekeeping items as we get started today. First is that we encourage you to post questions for today's panelists in the Q&A section of the Zoom. You can post questions by clicking the Q&A in the Zoom navigation menu, and we'll do our best to save time to answer you at the end of our discussion. Also, please do take 30 seconds to answer a short feedback survey after today's webinar. This includes the opportunity for you to give us feedback as well as to suggest topics for future webinars. And your feedback is very important to us, so 30 seconds is all that we ask. Now let's meet today's panel. Today we are joined by award-winning screenwriter and producer James Seamus. Among his many credits, James is known for the award-winning films The Ice Storm and Brokeback Mountain. He is former CEO of Focus Features, bringing audiences films including Milk and the Dallas Buyers Club. He is founder and CEO of Symbolic Exchange, whose recent works include The Assistant, Driveways, and the award-winning trans comedy Adam. His feature directorial debut and adaptation of Philip Roth's Indignation premiered at the Sundance and Berlin Film Festivals, and he is also the creator, executive director, and co-writer of Somos, his first, uh, excuse me, his first television series available now on Netflix. We are also joined by Michael Helfand. Michael has over 37 years of management, finance, operations, and legal experience in the entertainment industry. He is CEO and co-founder of Amasia Entertainment, a production finance company whose recent productions include Wild Mountain Time and Them That Follow. He is of counsel in the entertainment department of Loeb & Loeb Law Firm. He is former president and COO of Marvel Studios and former COO of Beacon Pictures. And he is a board member of Film Independent, one of the leading nonprofit organizations supporting independent filmmakers. Our first of today's co-moderators is Alexis Alexanian, Vice President of Business Development and Industry Relations here at Entertainment Partners. Alexis has over 25 years of film and television experience as an independent producer and a production executive. She is former president of the production of production at Locomotive. She is former president of the board of directors of New York Women in Film and Television. She is current treasurer of BAFTA New York, and she is co-founder of Indignant, producer of Sundance hits Tadpole, Pieces of April, and Personal Velocity. And finally, also co-moderating moderating today's panel is John Hattity, Vice President of Incentive Groups here at Entertainment Partners, where he specializes in the monetization of tax credits and minimum guarantees. John began his film career at Orion Classics, a division of Orion Pictures, where he served as technical and administrative director. He is former president and CEO of Hattity & Associates, a consultancy firm specializing in risk management and production finance. He is also former Executive Vice President of Motion Picture and Television Production Finance for Miramax Films, and his recently financed productions include Snowden, American Made, and The Assistant. Panelists, welcome to all of you, and thank you for joining today's discussion. We have quite a tremendous response to just today's uh, series kicking off, and I know that we have a lot to cover today. So John and Alexis, uh, please, let's get right into it. What can we share with our audience about equity financing? Thanks, Natalie. And welcome, James and uh, Michael and Alexis. Um, we really appreciate your taking the time to be here. So today we're going to talk about equity financing and in this and we're going to we're going to just focus on equity financing today. There'll be other webinars that will address things like soft money financing and tax incentives and pre-sales and bank loans and all that stuff. But today we're really focused on equity. And um, and I guess we should start by talking about what does that really mean? Right. So, you know, arguably, I'd say that that it is actually giving away 
most times, not always, uh, part of the asset, right, that you own as a producer or creator um, in exchange for the cash. Um, so I, I, I have to start with James because James, you're a, you're a writer, director, producer. So you, I can only imagine that you are so emotionally attached to your content right? So if you're going to go out there and raise equity, how challenging is that knowing that there's the chance you're going to have to share ownership of that asset? Well, Chris, thanks so much for having me on the panel, uh, John and everybody at EP and all you folks out there listening. I, I'm actually on this panel, uh, the kind of grinning idiot. That is to say, I am all those things and I'm somebody who's gone cap in hand to ask for money. Um, but uh, I'm here to listen as much as and learn as much as to participate because I, I've been uh, both uh, at times successful at this, but also, uh, as you say, a victim of that success from time to time, too. That said, um, to be honest, uh, equity and ownership, as we know, are tendentious concepts, even in the current phase of late and perhaps final capitalism in which we find ourselves. That is to say, the leveraging of leverage, the the you know the mortgage-backed securitization of everything, is not only affects us at the front end as we go and ask uh, usually uh, uh, wealthy high-net individuals, uh, e.g., whatever, whatever distant cousin might have money uh, for help with our films, but also on the other flip side, in other words, we're conditioned by the so-called back end, uh, and so at the other side of this, you would think like, oh. A distributor licensing your movie is not an owner of that film. But in fact, the terms and conditions under which such licenses are now usually negotiated and finalized makes the difference between ownership and use very tenuous. So what's happening now in the uh, equity uh, world vis-a-vis filmed entertainment and televised entertainment is that uh, the, uh, the, the touch points for the availability of vacuuming up that free floating money out there that's waiting for you, all you guys out there, folks out there who have your projects ready to finance, uh, 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 is the touch points are still there. The vacuum is still waiting to vacuum up their money. But uh, the, uh, on the other end, the little uh, place where the money comes back uh, at them, that side has been kind of sewn up even more efficiently than usual. And Hollywood has always been traditionally quite efficient at getting people's money and then figuring out a way to hold on to it. But now we have a situation in which the multiplicity of what we used to call windows, that is to say, that kind of waterfall-like uh, sequencing of media to which your film, let's say we'll just talk about film for the moment, uh, might have walked through. And let's say you made a movie and it went to a festival, but it wasn't that successful in terms or enough of an, there wasn't enough of an appetite for it to get a theatrical release. Well, there was still the home video release, or you could still sell it as a part of a TV package, or you know, there were all kinds of places where the circulation and, and, and monetization for your film could exist. Um, all of those are, are now conglomerating. And it's a political issue as much as an economic one. So now your equity uh, investor is no longer somebody who can look at a presentation and say, oh, well, here, the, you know, the money starts here and then there and then there. And then, you know, if you get the X for the theater, if you get this box office, there'll be a rate card that will, the pay TV will pay you a percentage, you know, the distributor, and you can kind of figure it out. Now your investor is uh, typically somebody who, uh, uh, the, the night before you meet them for that first meeting was at the table uh, in Vegas, usually at the airport, not even at one of the uh, uh, casinos, where they were putting uh, more or less their college fund, their kids' college fund on the red 14, you know. Uh, and, and that's really what this is about. It's about now saying, look, we've got um, a chance to for the little ball to fall on the red 14. And that's kind of what you got because of the of the consolidation on the rear. We can talk more specifically about this and the psychology with which you approach such people. Um, but that's that's the current challenge. It's, it's uh, as heightened as it has ever been for independent media makers right now. Well, you, you actually touched on something really. That, uh, there's a there's a expression that I use all the time, which is when I'm when I in the old days when I would be out raising equity. Um, you know, the first question that an equity investor or a potential investor would ask is, "How am I going to get my money back?" Mm -hmm. Right. And so, 
you know, when when you were able in the old days, right, when you're talking about the platforms that the different platforms that that the distribution takes place on, you know, you did have if you if you missed on one platform, you had the potential to make it up on another platform and so and so down the road. And and you were able to to respond to the investor by saying, okay, well, here, here's how this is going to play out over the next seven to 10 years. And, and then the next question they ask is, okay, wh- then when that doesn't work, how do I get my money back? Okay. Right. And so that, that second question now is becoming incredibly difficult to answer. That's right. Wouldn't you agree, Michael? <laughs> oh, most definitely. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, it's a, it's, it's so interesting the moment we're in because at the same time that there all is the pro- proliferation of all these new services and streamers to exploit content on, you know, projecting with any level of certainty whether you're going to get a deal or not down the road uh, and at what, and at what economic level has become very challenging, frankly. Um, you know, independent finance used to live and die uh, and was and was propped up in a, in a very big and successful way by foreign pre-sales, okay, where you'd package up a project and you'd hire a sales agent and they would go to the foreign markets and, and festivals and and pre-sell a, a big chunk of your um, uh, of your budget. And that was great to show to potential equity investors because, you know, it, you were showing them there's real interest in the film, number one, and the package. And number two, it was a clear downside. There was downside hedge protection against recouping uh, the, the full cost of the movie. Um, and it also allowed, you know, you could take those contracts, as, as you know, and uh, you could bank them and, and, and get um, uh, a bank or other, you know, a debt financier to put up a big chunk of the, of the movie. So that meant effectively that if you had a $10 million movie, for example, you didn't really need 10 million in equity, you didn't need to find investors quote, you know, to put up the full 10 million. Maybe you could get away with only raising 4 million and the rest could be banked based on um, contracts. The problem there is that the foreign sales market has uh, softened quite a bit um, and um, it seems to be feast or famine. If you have a big package, they're hungry and want to buy. But um, so many of the foreign um, uh, buyers and distributors, they they want to know that there's a theatrical release uh, in the United States. And that has become increasingly difficult to guarantee by not just independent producers and, and filmmakers, but even, you know, even the studios are now, you know, the, every film they make is not going uh, uh, for theatrical release necessarily. So, you know, that the, 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 the marketplace is creating new challenges. Um, we haven't even started in on the pandemic challenges, but right. just, just in terms of the, the, the moving, the ground moving, in terms of lesser, less distribution, theatrical distribution, more streamers buying up front. Um, you really have to uh, keep your eyes wide open and, and try and um, assess where the marketplace is at any given moment. But I do believe an important thing in raising equity is to, you know, n- know, what, know the marketplace and balance the, the, the downside risk with the upside, because when it works, it's a, this business can be amazing. And I, I, um, I made a movie some years ago uh, called The Call with Halle Berry. And, um, you know, we made it for $12 million and it grossed 70 plus million dollars. And we had the right financial structure. And I've been writing checks to our investors for, you know, eight years and, and I'm writing the checks happily, you know, um, because that means that everyone did well. And when you have happy talent, they want to be in business with you again. And when you have investors that got their money back with a return, they're actually right there when you, when you want to go back to them and ask them to invest in a new movie. So I think it's wonderful when you can pay out net profits to people. So you you actually touched on something that I was I was actually going to start talking about later in this session, but but 
I wanted to talk about exit strategies, right, for investors mm -hmm. um, and whether or not exit, exit strategies are a good thing or, or not, right? And it sounds like from what you just said that when you are in a relationship with a, an investor, a financial relationship, it, it sounds like in the case of the call, an exit strategy may not have been the right choice because you're still writing checks. They're still happy. Everybody's got smiles on their faces. And there's an opportunity for you to go back to the well on another project because you didn't sever that tie. Absolutely. You, when you say exit strategy, you mean like to buy them out and or sell all rights in the film and take, yeah. take an upfront payment and, and, and not look to get the overages and, and the, the ongoing revenue stream. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because because because, you know, as continuing to have that relationship, as you just said, <clears throat> means that you have to have you have to do reporting to them. Yeah, right. For sure. And you, you have to continue to do that. And, you know, your the call was was several years ago and now you're working on other movies. You know, there are some producers that would say, I, I don't want to be working on the call anymore. I want to be I want to move forward. But it sounds like you've been able to leverage that kind of relationship to your advantage. Yeah. No, I, I, I love working on the call. <laughs> it keeps generating, <laughs> keeps generating money. So, like, why wouldn't I be happy to work on that? But no, it is important. And, and, and as you as you know, it's uh, you, you know, you do have to maintain those relationships if you want to have the dialogue on the next one and the next one. And we're always looking for ways to, you know, um, take advantage of a, a successful movie and try and build a franchise by looking at other opportunities. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it, but it's tough out there. And of course, uh, m m the call is, 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 is the great story. And there are plenty of movies where um, the, that story is not what is told at the end of the day. Um, I, do, I do try and at least when I'm evaluating and deciding to go to our investor group, um, who, who in our case, uh, my company, are mostly um, uh, a group of high net worth individuals who, you know, have been, have come back in uh, to, to each of the movies in succession um, because they're, they're real relationships and I'm not just looking to take their money and say goodbye. Um, I am very focused on the downside um, risk and, and making sure that, you know, even if every movie isn't a hit, that we get their money back and um, and, they, and and we break even, and or, or if there's a loss, it's de minimis. Um, so I don't even go, it, particularly in the current environment, I, I I don't push equity investors to put money in movies where I don't really see an opportunity for them to make their money back. It's that simple for me. Yeah. You know, just listening to you, Michael, John, I'm just going to jump in for a second. Yeah, please. Um, just in terms of choosing, you know, the type of equity investor that you want involved in your project. I mean, Michael is is outlining a story and has, you know, the good fortune of a productive and positive history with the investors he's speaking of. Most of the people I imagine in our audience today are searching for those equity investors and trying to figure out what, you know, what makes a good, healthy equity investor. And I, I wanted to just share a story about a, a small movie that I produced many years ago where I was racking my brain for um, somebody who might give me a, you know, it was like two and a half million dollars. And I remembered servicing through Indigent, the company that Gary Winnick and I started in 1999, servicing our Japanese distributor, um, and, and keeping up a very good and positive relationship with her. Uh, for those of you who have made movies that have gone to Japan, they release their films and they produce these beautiful books about the film and they need a lot of photos and they need some articles written by the director and the writer, et cetera. And so for eight or nine movies that I had to distribute, I had to produce a lot of materials for her. We had this ongoing relationship and her work shifted and she ended up working with a, a technology company for some very wealthy Japanese um, men. And she, when I asked her, would she consider investing at my, what I call my $2 million lunch? She said, yes, absolutely. And, and so what I wanted to impart for the group was that 
you can mine the relationships you've had, the professional relationships you've had, people who are savvy and understand the business, who are not complete novices, because I think it's uh, risky, as Michael and James have and John have spoken about, um, at the very least, it's risky, um, but it's a it's a it's a life. You know, you're on these movies for a very long time. And I'm sure John's going to get into the timing that, that people can <laughs> uh, anticipate that, you know, recoupment might happen. But um, I wanted to share that you you never know. You may have a working relationship with someone who isn't in a position to become a, a full fledged equity investor. And then you have to say to yourself, what am I willing to give up? What does that credit look like? What does that back end look like? And I'm sure, John, you want to talk a little bit about that, too. I, I do. I, and, I'm, and I'm curious if you remember, did, did your Japanese distributor actually have an ownership interest in the project or was it really just a financing deal where you agreed on what the back end would look like and you know they they put up some equity in exchange for some kind of participation on the project yes they did have an ownership um, position um, and that's an interesting case study that 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 film and what happened and it was uh you know we, we did go to can with a piece of it but it was right before that economic downturn of 2008. And so we really didn't get the, uh, you know, a worldwide distributor in the way that we had hoped. And uh, so sometimes people say when things come together so easily and beautifully and the shoot is wonderful that then the distribution side might suffer. And I can just vouch for that. That, that was the instance there, but. Right. Well, I've, I've had many lovely shoots that were love fest that actually the films were wildly successful. So you never Excellent. know. Excellent. You never, there's, there's we no remain relation. hopeful. There's no yeah. I've also right. seen, you know, comedies where after every take, the entire crew is laughing and then you finish the film and it's essentially a tragedy that no one <laughs> I, I would assume that of the 428 participants listening in, hundreds, most folks are probably in the position of not having that deep reservoir of network of people who understand the business who don't have a track record and who probably are thinking like, what I need to do is to create a pitch uh, of some kind that indicates my deep knowledge of the industry and the fact that my film, which includes somebody in a superhero outfit on Halloween, therefore is like a Marvel movie, which has people in superhero outfits. And therefore in my deck, if I show that there's somebody in a superhero outfit, in that movie, it'll be like this one that made all this money, and that will convince my investors that this is a great investment. And my uh, free, unwanted advice um, to those of you who find yourselves in that situation, and I and believe me, I still find myself in that situation more or less every morning I wake up and try and make the movies I do, uh, is the following, which is your main goal, therefore, in speaking uh, to prospective investors is actually to get them to say no. And I will tell you why, because if you find yourself treading water with somebody who's like, oh, interesting, I don't know, maybe, what can you show me? What's the return? Where's the waterfall? How much am I really gonna make? When am I gonna get it back? When am I gonna really get it back? All that stuff. And the conversation goes on and on and on, and you're just just reshuffling your deck and coming up with more exciting and wonderful uh, comps for your film, but really have no idea what you're doing. Um, in general, 90 to 99.7% of those conversations end up in the toilet anyhow. Um, and what you really need to do, um, I think, in, in the situation, especially if you're just starting out, is go, look, I'm starting out. This could be an epic failure. I may be you know, driving an Uber next year after I finish this, my first production, uh, uh, because this could literally fall off a cliff, like most independent films do as they do, this, th those are just the statistics. On the other hand, I think I've got something here. You know, proof will be in the pudding. I need crazy people uh, to go on this journey with me. You seem crazy enough um, to be part of this, uh, a fun part of this journey. Please do not put up your kid's college fund. That's really not something I wanna live with uh, here. But if you're up for the journey, we're, we're going in together. I do have a really good entertainment attorney who's done this before. I'm not doing this by myself, free unwanted advice. Um, and find those people, uh, find those people. It does not mean that you have to be unprofessional. Your deck can give comps. Your deck and pitch can reference successes. 
But um, if you are referencing successes as the only comps, um, you are actually displaying your own ignorance of the world that Alexis and Michael and John and I live, uh, live every day and are still surviving to tell the tales of, which is to say most independent features are not successes. And your potential investors need to know that and need to know that you know that too. So, uh, and if they, if they get even that assurance and they're still interested in the conversation, you may have a sell. So let's, you, you've, you've mentioned DEC several times. And so I just, you know, for those uh, of our, our listeners who aren't familiar with what a DEC is, there are, let's, let's talk for a second about the proper documentation that you need to use when you're about to go out there and raise money. So the, the deck that James is talking about is a pitch deck, which you know, sometimes people call it a prospectus, but it's, it's, not, it's not a legal document. It's, it's basically, it's used, and we're gonna send you an example of it, people, just so that you know, um, subsequent to this panel, we will be sending out uh, an email follow-up that will include access to an example of a pitch deck, an example of a, a, a real proper offering memorandum. Uh, well, it won't have an example of the offering memorandum, but there'll be a checklist for the pitch deck or the prospectus. There'll be a checklist for the uh, offering memorandum, which I'll talk about in a second. And you'll also see an example of a pitch deck that has been used in the past that was created by our friend and producer, uh, Mary Jane Skalski. So um, th thank you, Mary Jane, give you credit for uh, allowing us to use that. But so let's talk about the documents. So the pitch deck, so that gets you the meeting, right? Hopefully that gets you in the room. Um, you know, it's colorful, it's, it's got pictures, it may have some numbers in it. Um, it's got, you know, a list of, of everyone that's attached to the project. And, you know, you're trying to get a potential investor excited about the project. And, you know, if you're, and I'd like to know if anybody disagrees with me, but if you're out there and you're just going to friends and family, maybe, you know, one or two people, friends and family raise to raise some money. Um, and that document is all you've presented. Um, and, and obviously you'd have some kind of agreement, formal agreement between the parties um, so that everyone understands what the expectations are and what the deal is, then, then that's cool. That, that works and people do that a lot. When you start to raise money from, for instance, high net worth individuals, three or more people, and you're using a document with forward looking statements in it, you are selling securities. And when you're selling securities, the law is very clear about how that needs to be handled. And so when, when we talk about an offering memorandum, a proper offering memorandum, it's not a 10 or 12 page pitch deck. It's more like a 100 to 200 page document that a securities lawyer or an entertainment lawyer with securities experience needs to do for you. And there's an awful lot that needs to be included in that document. And, and this is to ensure that your raise is SEC compliant. And the, the risk of, not, now here, here's the thing, do people raise money from a number of individuals without being SEC compliant? Absolutely. Yes, they do. Is it right? Absolutely not. And the risk you run is that if, if you have raised money using forward-looking statements and you are not SEC compliant in your documentation, it only takes one person, one disgruntled investor to walk into the SEC and file a claim. And potentially you might have to give their money back. So it, it really becomes, uh, you, you really become vulnerable. I, and Michael, as a, as a lawyer, you, you know full well what I'm talking about. Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's why, um, you know, most people uh, are looking to raise their money from a smaller group, L less is more. Uh, you know, if you're under 35 uh, investors and they're, um, uh, 
quote, high net worth individuals who satisfy some legal um, uh, tests, then it's a private offering exemption. And, um, and you don't have to file a formal uh, regulation document in, in, with the SEC. Um, that requires the investors usually to be, you know, have net worths of over a million dollars and be making significant annual income. And if they satisfy those threshold tests, then um, and and you are, have a limited numbers. You know you need all of that to be documented in the financing agreements with these individuals. But then you're usually um, safe. Uh, the problem is a lot of um, a lot of uh, people grab these form private offering documents. Don't really you know, know what they're doing. They change the name of the film and the people and they go out and, and, um, and they try and do it kind of, you know, uh, seat of their pants. And I, and that's, that can be very dangerous and it, op it, it opens, it does open you up for, for claims. So uh, I would be, uh, you know, I would recommend to the participants listening that if they're going to go out and raise money from individuals, um, many individuals like that, then absolutely, John, you're right. And, John, and, and Jim, you're right that they need to be represented by capable counsel and be advised properly. Um, the other thing that um, uh, the, the, the extreme, like, so you can raise money from, you know, a couple of individuals and or companies that want to put money in as equity or, or even, you know, uh, family funds. And then at the other and then the case we just talked about where you're raising money from a lot of different people. And then there's the at the extreme of that is, of course, the new way of raising capital on the Internet. Um, with Kickstarter and 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 those kinds of um, online funding, I've never done that. Um, but the, the the rules have been modified to allow you to take money from a lot of investors, way more than thirty five, and um, and have them put in a lot less money. Many of them are not um, high net worth individuals. And I've been amazed how people have been somewhat successful raising money uh, through Kickstarter and other crowdfunding platforms. But I would, make, I would make the same recommendation, which is make sure you comply with all of the requirements to raise money in a Kickstarter crowdfunding platform. Because again, if you don't, you will be. You could be subject to liability. What you promise people and what you have to deliver is very specific, and um, and you need to be very careful as you navigate through those waters. And I would Michael, just I, uh, sorry. Uh, I would just simply add to that, uh, Michael. That one of the things I've seen, even on the extreme low budget ends and you know independent documentary end, is that Kickstarter campaigns and GoFundMe's etc. have have. Uh, have uh, come with various promises uh, at times that sometimes get you into like the producer's land. That is to say, oh, I now have 473 executive producers. Each one has 10% of the profit. So uh, it's really good to do some just elementary school mathematics before you get into uh, making promises that convey any kind of value to potential investors who might write a five, you know, might, might just press $3 wow. on the asset <laughs> card and suddenly come on. Personally, I don't sure. like to have that many partners. <laughs> right. Back to less is more for me. I agree with that. I was going to say, Michael, for our audience, um, what do you recommend in terms of timing and finding the right attorney? Because I remember many, many, many moons ago when I went to a, a famous entertainment attorney who will remain nameless and is a lovely man. He said, you know, Alexis, I'd love to take you on, but I'm not, you know, I, you can't afford me. And, you know, there's no, I don't see where we're going to make any money together. And anyway, how would you, how would you advise some of the younger producers or newer producers in the space to find a savvy entertainment attorney to begin this process to sort of understand the lay of the land before they do a GoFundMe campaign and, you know, to uh, do, you know, due diligence before they, they move forward. Yeah. Well, I think the good news is there actually are a lot of capable entertainment lawyers out there. Um, 
Um, but finding the right one for you and your project is very important. Um, you know, um, the budget frequently determines, uh, you know, who, who and, and, and who you should be hiring and whether you can afford them or not. Um, but, you know, look, I, I, Loeb & Loeb is a wonderful uh, entertainment law firm. They've, they've, been, they've been at it for many decades. I want, it's one of the original entertainment law firms. And we do very, uh, I started there. The, the funny thing is I started there uh, many years ago. Uh, left and went to work at various companies. And, um, and three years ago, I went back as of counsel. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a hybrid in the sense that I'm both still producing and uh, representing clients. And, and we do the full range of representation. Um, and I think with, with some firms, they're really great at financing and distribution. And uh, the other entertainment firms you know, are really good at talent representation. And then there are a, quite a few smaller firms that cater to the, the independent film um, uh, space in terms of production representation. Um, and I think the best, uh, you have to find the right match and you have to find someone that you actually feel good about and, that, and, and they wanna represent you. Like your point uh, about the story you told, which is, you know, uh, you want a lawyer who's going to be excited to represent you, not that you're taking up time and space away from their other matters. Um, but there are definitely uh, some, some, some terrific uh, firms to do low budget independent production. Um, uh, and there are firms now specializing in documentary production, which is a, a slightly different um, uh, skill set. And you know, with the proliferation of, of documentary content, both film and series, you know, it's a great time for, for that. But um, I think you have to, you know, attend conferences like this and, and, and meet people and network. And, um, you know, Film Independent is, is a perfect way uh, that organization caters to, you know, uh, up and coming filmmakers and the resources that are available on their website, um, the access points, uh, I recommend it highly for people who are, you know, starting out and trying to navigate their way uh, through independent film. And I, I'd, I'd simply add to that, Michael, uh, besides film independent, obviously the Gotham formerly, whatever it was uh, in New York, yeah. but also, um, uh, IRP. Yeah, the IP. But I, I would say that um, uh, especially post, or we hope it's post-pandemic, whatever this interregnum leads to, um, a lot of the festivals have gone hybrid or online. A lot of the activities around them are now more accessible than ever before. Yeah. And my recommendation to the, you folks out there who are really at the starting gate, you have a, a, a very low budget independent feature that you want to make. Um, you're going to be listening in and sitting in and watching now the next wave of festivals you have access to without having to travel to in many ways. And read those credits, because if you start looking at the films that are comparable to yours that you like and admire, the chances are those law firms that specialize in this kind of stuff will start popping up two or three or four of those credits. Excellent advice. And I, and then the other thing that's so interesting is that a lot of your peers and, and that cohort, you don't know them, but you shoot an email, you get their email address or you DM them or whatever you want, and they're happy to share their experiences and their advice. Uh, some of those credits that keep popping up might be people who keep popping up because they're chasing the ambulances and just more successful at that and you want to stay away from them. But in general, the people, especially on the legal side, whose credits do appear regularly in that low budget space are people who have a passion for the kind of work that you're, you're doing um, and know how to structure deals even at the lowest budget level where they become partners with you. And there are many of those lawyers too, I was just gonna add, that have worked at big firms and now they've gone off on their own. And so they have some more, uh, more of a cottage um, you know, approach to it, but they have tons of experience having been partners or been you know, uh, long-term uh, members of very active firms. So you can seek those people out too. Yeah. 
So I want to go back to uh, to address something that Michael touched on earlier, which is, you know, we were talking about the number of executive producers, right, that, which could just explode, right, based on based mm-hmm. on how you're doing your fundraising. Let's talk for a second about a, a typical structure so that people understand, you know, how do you set this up from a corporate perspective? And I, you know, I, I'd, I'd start by saying as a as a good example, um, a structure might look like, you know, setting up an LLC, right, where where 50 percent of that LLC is owned by your investors and the other 50 percent is owned by the producer. Right. Or the, and and collectively, the LLC owns the asset. Right. Owns the rights to the movie, owns the in many cases, the copyright um, will own the revenue stream and share it. Right. So when money starts to trickle down into the LLC and we'll we'll go into much greater detail on the waterfall later in the series. But, you know, when when money starts to trickle down into the LLC, hopefully, um, you know, 50 percent of that revenue will be shared by the investors based on their level of investment. Right. And the other 50 percent will go to the producer. And one of the things I know Alexis and I were talking about the other day was, you know, how do you, how do you, how do you share part of that revenue stream with folks that maybe talent, right? Maybe the writer, maybe the director, um, maybe and maybe it's in exchange for taking a lower salary on the project, right? So you're offering them a carrot. Um, uh, by way of giving them a piece of the back end. Well, that's what the producer share is for. It's to divvy up between the creative elements of the production, um, separate and apart from the financiers. Would you, I mean, James, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, uh, this concept, and again, for those of you out here who haven't gone through the process, you start with a, a conceptual architecture, which says capital, 50% of what comes in and talent, labor, that's the other half. And if you say the producer, let's say there's one producer, you, you start by assuming you've got 50% to share fairly with the creative team, the people who work on the film, the, the stars, the writer, the director. And there are various ranges of percentage of that 50%, or let's say percentage of the 100 that it comes out of your 50 that are uh, more or less industry norms for uh, you know, low-budget independent films that are working often with talent that's at the beginning of their careers. By the time you're getting to work with you know, Steven Spielberg and whatever, it's a whole different ballgame in terms of the chunk right. they take that. So you know, 2.5% might be going to a writer, 3 to 5% to a director. Uh, if you have a, 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 an actor who's actually meaningful for raising financing, that actor will assume that you will be offering them a larger share of, of your 50% than if you just hired them two weeks before production for the third role. Um, and then, you know, you've, so you've got all that. Uh, the, the, then the, the, the money has that other 50%. So you've got 100% of what we'll call producers, you know, the, the producers, net, whatever you want to call it. You start to have to, now you've got to imagine if you're, if you're talking to potential equity investors, well, Okay, so you make the movie for a million dollars. You quote sell it for two million, right? So you, uh, that means that the basically the first million has to go back to pay off the investors. So now you're down. You got a million left. Generally speaking, in your agreements, you're going to give the investors some kind of vig, some kind of percentage for the time essentially that they had to park their money there instead of at. Uh, Wells Fargo, if they kept the account there, where they were earning 0.05% interest. So you give them a certain VIG on top of that, uh, the, the, their investment of a million dollars. I don't know what, you know, it depends. It's up to negotiation. It would be 15% or 20 or 25%. So, and for a highly speculative venture like a low budget indie, 25% VIG is not, uh, not normal, right, Michael? That's kind of a, you know, it yeah, I, I'd say I, I find the range to be, you know, uh, the, you know more in the 
15 to 20 percent range 15 to 20. 25 is getting a little high but it but it's done i mean if you need, if you need the money and uh, yeah. uh people agree and yeah. so, uh, so let's call it 20 percent yeah so the two million that came in that's 1.2 million that's already gone to your investors before we're talking about splitting up the spoil so now there's yeah. eight and, that and don't don't forget usually the sales agent off the oh. top we're going to get there in just a second. <laughs> right. You sold it for $2 million, You think $2 million is coming in, right? But in fact, there's a lot of pieces in front of this that for everybody, not just you as a producer, but also for your investors. Number one, of course, if you sell to some kind of distributor who has, who's going to put up some minimum guarantee, uh, but may actually just do a, a revenue sharing deal themselves these days, right? So people mm -hmm. as distributors are starting to say, look, We'll spend a million dollars marketing your film uh, and uh, sending it out into the, you know, whatever, the ethers. Uh, but we have to get our marketing costs back, plus our distribution fee, plus the interest on our blah, 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 plus our overhead. That money is not going to go directly to you. First, it's probably going to go to some kind of entity like Freeway or some collection agency that everybody, the third party that people can trust to hold the money. That was your, if you go to your investor say, Look, we sold it for $2 million and I, I put it into my bank account, but my partner spent it on that. We had to pay off our charge. But no, it's going to go to a third party, and they'll, ch they'll charge about a percentage point themselves just for being fair to divvy it up. If, if your movie was such, even at a low budget, that you hired Screen Actors Guild actors, and you got flipped uh, under a low-budget agreement with the uh, 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 IATSE as a crew, or in post-production you hired... Uh, an, uh, an editor who's in the union, so seventy seven, whatever it happens, you have residuals that come in front of all of that, and those can right. certainly add up. And so often you have to part a certain amount of money into a residuals bond because Screen Actors Guild doesn't trust you, um, and so there's that money. And then of course the money then then has to get shaved by the sales agent if you use one or an international sales distributor who's not distributing to the retail but distributing to the business itself, and those fees, as you know can range anywhere from if it's just happens to be an agency that muscles in because they cast somebody and they take what they call a consulting fee or a packaging fee for just doing their jobs, which would be to represent the talent. Other agencies actually are tremendously helpful. Uh, they have fantastic independent financing uh, uh, departments. They charge a lot of money. They can charge five, seven, 10, and even more percent for that. So of that $2 million, whatever you're calling it, as it finds its way back, it may funnel enough of, there may be enough to get your investors whole, but uh, depends on the circumstances. But your producer share, you might see $3 in it at the beginning. Um, and then finally, over time, if you're lucky and if things grow, the money will start to come in, which you will share fairly with your, your, your partners and your, uh, your crew. But it's not, there are no, so there's no simple math there, and I hope this okay. quick accounting and just kind of uh, de however depressing it may be is also a reality check that is helpful. To yeah. yeah, I would, I it would. It requires uh, a plan, right? Like that's the whole thing. It requires a plan and some thinking ahead of the game. Yeah, I, I would, to, for ease of, of understanding, I, I think it's helpful to distinguish between ownership, what John was talking about, and maybe at the beginning and, and where you know, the investors have an ownership interest usually, and the producer has an ownership interest. This, that's usually talking about the, the back end ownership, if you will, and what happens after the film is fully recouped. Distinguish that from what happens when the money comes in and all of the different uh, people that are entitled to participate in the revenue flow. And that's what we would, we've alluded to earlier when we called it a, a waterfall. So um, uh, the money comes in and it, and it literally goes through this um, step program of um, accounting. I think, I think the proliferation of collection accounts has you know, been a very good thing for establishing, you know, um, uh, a little more trust. In the old days, you're, you're, you're absolutely right, Jim. People would get payments and then where's the money and you'd have to chase it. But it provides a certain amount of transparency to all the people that are involved in the, in the film and well worth the, 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 the small percent, I think, well worth the small percentage that, that you pay them. Um, residuals, people don't think about so, 
so quickly. I'm glad you brought it up because, you know, if you have all of the guilds involved, including, you know, SAG, um, the WGA, DGA, and, and the below the line guilds of IATC and AFM, you can be talking about 15 to, to, to 18 percent of the gross amounts that are coming into your pot your, it, that are getting paid out to residuals before you start applying the, the, the rest of the revenue to repayment of bank loans and tax and repayment of tax credit loans and this and then ultimately paying back all the investors plus their premium. So there, there are, are quite a few people and entities feeding at the trough before you even get to the 50-50 split between investors typically and talent. Um, um, and so again, you do need to uh, be well advised about, you know, w what the, you know, customary uh, splits and payments and fees and, um, you know, uh, and that just comes from, you know, doing it and, and, and having good representation. Michael, what happens when you have investors that are asking for different deals? Um, yeah, you, that's a great question. And the answer is, you know, uh, you want to keep everyone. Certainly, I like to have all the definitions of, of what net proceeds means be the same because the minute you're, you got a, a it causes a lack of trust and B it complicates your life. And, and if you can have everyone on the same definition, that's really important, but that doesn't mean you can't differentiate in terms of what the, um, what, what the different investors get. Um, you know, on the Kickstarter GoFundMe, it's very clear if you put up this amount of money, you get that. And if you put this, you get a DVD. And if you, if you, put, if, you know, you get your name on the movie. Um, I think with, with you know, uh, with more sophisticated productions, there's still a bit of that. I mean, someone who's putting up $2 million and not $100,000, uh, I think deservedly so should get a better credit, uh, an executive producer credit or something like that than someone who puts in a hundred or twenty five thousand dollars and maybe they get you know a lesser credit uh, uh, an associate or, uh, or a co-producer or a co-executive uh, producer credit and um, and and there are different entitlements that you can um, uh, put in place, but I think you need to be careful. So people don't feel like Definitely. your pers it's personal that, that establish your levels, what, what's going to generate, um, uh, the, the extra perks, if you will, or the, you know, who's attending the premiere, who's not attending the premiere. Um, but, but I think in terms of the splits of the back end participation, try to keep it on a pro rata basis. The only time that I, I've varied from a straight pro rata allocation of the profits is if someone either puts up the critical initial seed money, uh, pre-production monies, which everyone tends to forget about, which is really important chunk of your financing before everything comes into place. And it can be a more risky chunk of financing. And then, you know, uh, uh, Sometimes it's, uh, it's that final chunk that manages to squeeze the extra vig out of your pocket. But, um, but ideally, you want everyone participating on the same basis. And Michael, to, think, to, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I think it's really important to be judicious. You might get excited initially thinking, well, I have this pool of my 50%, let's say, but you really have to take a thoughtful approach to this. And I've always found that I mean, not to contradict what Michael's saying, because that is important to really assess the level of the uh, contribution uh, from one equity investor to another, and also meaningful attachments, i.e. the cast and or a director. But you want to sort of map out various scenarios. This is what it might look like, plan A, plan B, plan C. Not to be pedantic, but I think it's really important to think it all the way through the number of exec producer credits you actually have and want to give away, the number of full producer, you know, having grown up, you know, and earned my stripes, I'm very sensitive about that producer credit. 
right? And there's all kinds of, I mean, this might yeah, be another course. webinar, John, about the PGA and, you know, the definition of a producer. But think through that. Thoughtfully, my other uh, concept was based on uh, something that Michael um, brought up, which is the idea of most favored nations. I think sometimes when you're dealing on a smaller independent feature and you have a number of people of about the same stature and you have an ensemble cast, it's worth sort of considering, you know, we did this really well at Indigent, right? We created a model that was replicated over and over again because it was really simple and it was really clear and everybody, and it's easy to sell. It's easy to get people involved if you say, this is the deal and it's the same for James and it's the same for Michael and totally. John might be putting up a fuss, but it's gonna be the same for John, <laughs> you know, whatever. Anyway, just wanted to- that a lot. Yeah. I think that's great. On the one hand, uh, and, and again, for those of you who are really at the starting gate on this stuff, one of the things that might happen is that you will meet uh, folks who have some experience in the industry as kind of financiers, producers of some kind. And they might say to you, you look, we can come in and bring in like half or all of this budget. I want to be a producer is the person who's actually brought all this in. And uh, I'll be a vester, of course, but um, and what what is what you're watching in that scenario, what you need to watch out for uh, is two things. One is it could be just great because that's what they do and they they're there to, you know, join forces with you and make the movie. Um, but to the point uh, that Mike was making of the kind of uh, uh, Kickstarter ness of uh, of the independent film scene, which was ever thus, but now has become a less you note much more uh, kind of on steroids. That is to say, we're basically selling credits, right? So this is really the Broadwayification of the independent film space, right? Because Broadway, you go and you look at you get the playbill and it's like, wow, there's 800 producers and they all happen to be, you know, investment bankers or spouses of investment bankers or whatever, you know, whatever. I mean, they're just selling off, you know, it's a business, right? So this is, this is certainly part of the landscape and you, you may or may not come across more, more or less sophisticated versions of it. In this case, on the one hand, a license is absolutely right. Most favored nations, anybody who's in that 50% investment part is getting the same deal, as Michael points out. It's so important. You do not want to be calculating 18 different versions of net proceeds because you have to kind of individually negotiate each member of your, uh, of your investment pool. On the other hand, there are people out there who are very good at playing, living on both sides of that divide between capital and labor. They're like, well, I'm over here because I'm bringing this money, but I'm also over here as your friend and partner. So therefore, not only do I get a piece of that 50%, but by the way, I should also be getting a fee out of the budget, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. so, uh, uh, so, you know, there is a way in which one body inhabits two souls in terms of independent film financing. But when you are dealing with those folks, you really, really want to be clear, rights and responsibilities because oftentimes the check comes with a lot of other baggage that you want to pre-negotiate what that baggage weight is, who's playing the tariff, paying the tariff, is it checkable or not? And it, it becomes extremely important to uh, when you are then faced with going to market and suddenly there are three different kinds of offers. There's the offer from the streaming service, which gets everybody out. But as we know, and this is something we haven't talked about, uh, this is where a lot of equity is seeing a return, which is basically you spend a million dollars on the movie and suddenly there's a mini bidding war and Netflix wants it for seven million. You're going to get a check, you divvy it up. And the good news is for Michael, even though he loves writing checks to all his investors, he'll never have to write another check again. Yeah. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> By, by the way, if the multiple is high enough, happy to do that too. <laughs> and I've done it. I've done it myself. I mean, not on my uh, bio, but for example, my, I got my investors to invest with uh, with Jason Blum and uh, the Benji remake. And we flipped it, as they say, to Netflix for a wild multiple. It was a lovely one check. There it is. I mean, Netflix breaks it up into four or eight. But that's fine. But that's not, then when we talk about ownership, what did you own? You owned a brief moment of your life that paid off, right? So uh, that's one version. The other version is, of course, that you have these other things, which are like, it's less money up front, but then it's a, it's a five-year license for this, plus the Middle East is coming in for that, plus your sales agent can do the airplanes and you know, the army for that. It's much more complicated. So suddenly, who has the right to decide? 
whether you take the bigger one here or the smaller one, but the longer thing and all that. And be, be careful, is all I'm saying, to invite into that decision people who came in from one side as passive investors and suddenly are very active in these discussions and find themselves having leverage over the fate of your work that you poured your own heart and soul into for so long. Now, they may be very good partners and wonderfully sophisticated, or they may be kind of panicky and jittery because one of the things they did when they came in as their partner was sell 25 executive producer credits to people that they met at their cocktail party at the Hamptons, and they don't want to go back to the cocktail party next week and uh, make it too complicated. Right. right. So this is what you got to watch out for if you yeah. get to that point. Very important thing point that you raised, Jim, which is you always need to have in the documentation it be very clear who gets to make that that decision. Even if you even if you have a, some kind of mutual approvals, that at the end of the day somebody has to have that tie breaking uh, right to move forward. Um, you know, w- typically the producer or, you know, uh, maybe a lead financer has that right. Um, and um, and um, you need to be really careful about it. Minor investors should never have the ability to, um, you know, throw a monkey wrench into the plans. And they typically don't understand and they're not, they're not as sophisticated as you are, Jim, about, um, you know, being able to make those decisions. Um, what, one other th- point that uh, I want to make is sometimes the 50, you also have to remember that sometimes the 50% is not carved up just by, you know, who put up the money uh, in terms of equity. Um, frequently, you have some debt financiers who are putting up gap financing. They charge an interest rate like a bank, usually higher, um, because they're basing it on estimates instead of hard contracts. But then they'll ask for an equity kicker. So suddenly, 5 or 10% may need to go to, you know, a debt financing partner. So so you do need to, uh, to Alexis's point, you need to be thinking ahead and figuring and making sure you have the flexibility in your financial model to accommodate whatever uh, structure you end up with at the end of the day. And then I want to just comment that for independent films, I love what, what that we've done that many times, Alexis, with on the talent side, which is to say, look, you know, everyone's working for less money. We're gonna we're gonna carve up the the, the back end, and it isn't personal. Um, you know, everyone's getting either the same percentage, or we're basing it on how many weeks each actor worked, and um, and you, you try and deflect anyone who's feeling like, well, I, I need to get more. And, um, and the only time you, you, you need to deviate from that sometimes is if you're building, even though it's a, um, it's a small, it can be a smaller role, but if you have a marquee uh, actor that is driving your foreign sales or driving your package, even though they may only be in the movie for, um, for a week or two weeks, you got to pay them more cash up front and you typically have to pay them more back end on, on, on the backside. So, um, you know, there are no hard and fast rules, just good guidelines to, uh, to, to, to start out with. That's right. Was, so let's gonna, go ahead, John. I'm sorry. No, I, yeah, time. Go, go ahead. Fin- yeah. We have no, just, finish your thoughts. I wanted to say, um, James had said early on something about the psychology of the equity investor, and I think that's really something interesting. And you really have to have your 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 best sort of intuitive powers um, when you're meeting and greeting these people. And when you have a pitch deck, and you're hopefully that'll be full of a lot of you know uh, you know visuals that that help you outline you know who the talent you know is and who's involved what your plan is to take it to market, what the comps are and all those things. And what you'll see is when you present that to an, an equity investor, you'll see the certain aspects of that deck resonate with, with various people. There may be investors like the fantasy investor is the very, very silent one. The one who is so excited about your project and has the money um, and is, is free and willing to, to do this to support you in your, your, your efforts. But you might also find that there are those who are really you know, uh, attracted to the sparkly bits of this, the market and the, you know, the ability to go to festivals and the meeting and greeting of the celebrities. And I'm not saying this 
it sounds obvious or it sounds trite, but it's really true. So it's time to like put your your best decoder ring on and try to try to assess like what's in it for them. Why do they want to be a part of this? Before you say, oh, I'll make you a producer or I'll give you, you know, X amount of back end. So Michael, last thought. Yeah, I was going to say there are like three buckets of investors, I call them. Um, and, uh, and, and and all of you guys have touched on different versions of it because, James, you're right. You want you want to know answer sooner rather than later. So you're not jerking around. But the three buckets, I think, are strategic investors, um, financial investors and the investors who are, are have a passion about the material or, or, or the business. And to me, the best the, the best two groups are the strategic investors because they want to invest. They want to access the content for some downstream exploitation and the passionate uh, uh, people who want to be in because the financial investors, the problem with them is that, that, that if there's just about sharpening the pencil and figuring out and it's all about the numbers. It, there's too much uncertainty and they just drive you crazy. And, you know, you know, go back to your hedge fund. <laughs> that's like, that. that's my best advice. So yeah. I think focus on the passionate investors and the strategic investors in the independent space. Um, you'll, 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 you'll do a lot better in the long run. Cool. Well said. Yes. So listen, I, it, in, in the interest of time, I, I do want to get to a question or two from, from um, the Q and A. So um, Natalie, if you can, kind of give us an idea of what some of the things people are asking. Sure. Yes. We've received a tremendous amount of, uh, of interaction from our audience, lots of questions coming in. Um, so we're just going to take a couple because we are running long on time. Uh, but this first question is um, kind of a follow-up to a couple of the points that you were just making a moment ago, Michael, um, about having a mix of different type of financing. And this question is, is there an optimal mix of um, equity and debt financing to fund your production? Anyone else want to jump on that? You know, well, look, I, you know, I, I'll, I'll tell you from what I've seen in our relationships with banks, when we are doing, um, you know, if we're providing a loan against the tax credit, right, um, and may, maybe the bank is providing a loan against uh, unsold territories, right, the, the, and there's a certain amount of equity involved, and there may be super gap involved, the banks, I, th I think generally what I've seen is that the banks like to limit the gap loan to about 30% of the budget, right? And they want 200% coverage on that loan, right? So if they're going to lend you a million dollars against unsold territories, they want to see that you at least have $2 million in, in sales estimates for those territories, right? And and probably lim limit their exposure to 30% of your budget. And then if I'm putting up you know, I'll make it up. If I'm putting up 20% of the budget in the uh, in the form of a tax credit loan, that's 50% of the budget. I, I, I would expect that banks would, I mean, there are lots of people that would fill the rest of the 50% with equity if they're successful. But if they're not successful and they're only able to raise 30%, of the budget in equity, then that 20% has got to come from somewhere. And it's usually a, a, a super gap loan, right? Where that's going to be more expensive than all the other financing, right? Because yep. they're taking more risk. I'd love to jump in. So I don't yep. know that I could say there's an optimal because, right. you know, it's like whatever you can get to, you know, you need to get your movie finance. But I, but I will say, Always, always, always try and, and, and to, to go and make your, your film in a, in, a, in a place that provides a tax incentive that because the reason why tax credits and rebates are so great is you actually don't have to pay them back. So they, they decrease the cost of your production without having usually without having to give them a back end participation and repay that money back. So that's number one, big plus. The second thing is what we talked about a little bit earlier is in the, in the lower budget space. And let's say we're talking about under a million dollars for indie films um, uh, and, and sometimes even more. What what we're finding is if you were to go out and try and pre-sell that to, and, and get some contracts that you can then take to a bank, 
What, what the problem with that is that a lot of your buyers, they, if they're going to jump in and buy and pay a multiple, like James talked about uh, uh, on a, a Netflix swooping in, they don't want to have by the world excluding eight territories. So on a million dollar budget, if you go out and pre-sale, you don't have a theatrical release commitment. Let's say you can get $200,000. <laughs> it's not enough downside protection to foreclose the opportunity that you will have at the end of the day to sell on a worldwide basis and do a beauty war. So be careful about not getting sucked into selling a sliver of the rights that then create a bigger problem for you after the fact. Absolutely. Yeah, and so, yeah, I, I, I agree on the lower budget stuff. Um, it, it, you know, given what Michael just said about pre-sales, which we had this issue just last year on something where we had very healthy pre-sales. And then of course the screamer came in and said, Hey, we're ready to take everything. We were like, well, actually Latin America. And I mean, we had to renegotiate those. We had to buy them out, basically pay them off uh, and took a small hit in order to make them a much bigger payoff, but we, we shouldn't have done it. So to my mind, equity is still very much preferred uh, and the very lower end as obviously the, the, the gap yeah. and the, the debt is great when you're in a bigger in a bigger playing field because it means you own own more of something that exactly. essentially you know you'll have some some kind of uh, downstream uh, you'll be able to get it back um, and I know we're not talking about the stuff this is a, this is an equity panel um, so we're not necessarily talking about banking and and and, and lending and tax credits uh, but of course John I just want to let you know the news today is. That movie that we went into pre-production on in 2017 in New York with Sunglass Productions, we just got today our New York State tax credit. Yay! <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and John is happy because he actually, thank you, uh, helped us with uh, with uh, financing at the, against that credit. And uh, But it's taken so long because there was so much production in New York, and this is just something to think yeah. about. Uh, he's uh, John is also going to be cashing a larger uh, interest check um, uh, before we see yeah. <laughs> the benefits of that because he took the risk, right? So he's, he's, right. he's uh, the interest on And I would add the following because I've worked with John on, on many, many movies over the years, both when we were together at, at Miramax Dimension, but, but also in the independent space. And it's so important not just to have good legal representation, but having a team like at EP, and I'm not doing the, I'm not doing the, the commercial promotion here, just because you invited me onto the panel. <laughs> it's, it's, I'm doing it's it. It's from because, the heart. It's because they know what they're doing. It's like they've discounted these tax credits and these contracts and MGs. They know exactly what to do. They know what they need to do. You, you, you are so much better off having someone in your corner that knows how to na navigate through. And, and, and by the way, each tax jurisdiction credit is different. Some are rebates. Some are tax credits. They know what they are doing, and they are they they're a, they're a valuable, very valuable partner to have um, in your corner as you're putting this stuff together. Well, thank you very much, both of you, for that wonderful, <laughs> wonderful plug, and I think that is the perfect way to end our panel. <laughs> uh, right. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much. Yes, thank you guys for inviting me on this. Thank I myself you. learned a lot, and thanks to everybody out there. I know we were not able to get to you know five percent of the questions, but I hope we answered most of them. I think right. we might be posting some of them. Natalie might let us know that we might post yeah. them on the production community and try to get yeah. some answers to people. So, Yes, absolutely. Thank you to everyone who did post a question. Uh, we know that we received many, many questions. Um, so if you would like to uh, keep the conversation going, we do encourage you to head over to the productioncommunity.com. We'll be posting questions and answers there. And you can also find a recording of today's webinar. Uh, we also received quite a few requests for that. Um, you can revisit today's webinar along with the entire library of master series, and we have many more episodes to come. Uh, so please do head over to the production community it is also your place to find uh, product news and support, COVID-19 news, including our reopening tracker. So many things are changing as COVID continues to develop. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that for you as well. We also have our resume portal in case you're looking for a job. So, so many resources to take advantage of. So we encourage you to head over to the productioncommunity.com. 
We would also like to encourage everyone to visit my.ep.com. And this is where production workers can access their last three years of US EP pay information. You can compare week over week changes to your pay, update your personal information if you have to happen to be relocating. Um, so a lot that you can do over on my.ep.com. It's also the destination to get the new movie Magic Budgeting, which is available now with a free one month trial. And you can also access our e-learning academy me. We have over a dozen courses available, including Production Accounting 101 and 201. And the EP Academy is really set up to help you take that next step in your career, learn our technology, learn skills that you might need to brush up on or level up on. So we really would encourage everyone to go, go over to my.ep.com and really start utilizing those resources today. Another thing we would like to let everyone know is that our production incentive site has moved and you can now find all of our production incentives information at ep.com. You can explore the latest in incentives news, use our jurisdiction comparison tool for side-by-side -side views of jurisdictions simultaneously. We have our incentives estimator, which can show you just how much you can save. And you can connect with John and the rest of our incentives group to ensure that your production gets the best incentive and financing guidance available available in the industry. So please do head over to ep.com and check out the incentives pages there. Thank you again to our wonderful panel. We had such a lively discussion and a lot was covered today and we were honored to have you participate. And thank you also to all of the wonderful attendees that came and listened to the conversation and posted questions. We hope that you all enjoyed this discussion and we hope that you stay safe and healthy. And we look forward to seeing you at the next Master Series. Thank you.